Just a reminder to our Speculating Wildly About Crime listeners, this is for entertainment purposes only and solely the thoughts and opinions of our team. We do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Speculating Wildly About Crime. I'm your host, Missy. Before we even get into today's episode, I want to let you know that we have a more in-depth version of this episode released a few weeks ago. So if you want to listen to that first and then come back and find out what our speculations are, you can definitely go do that. We're covering a case that I have been very baffled by for a really long time. Lorraine Ron was 14 years old and she lived with her mother, Judith, in New Hampshire in a two-bedroom apartment. Judith, she was dating a professional tennis player. And on the day of April 26, 1980, Judith is going to go watch her boyfriend play in a tennis match. And normally Maureen would go with her to these matches. But this day she asked her mom if she could stay home and Judith said that was okay. So Lorraine decided she was going to go hang out with some friends. But before she hung out with her friends in the evening, she was seen around by family and friends. And she was also uh, seen at a local convenience store. She was stocking beer or wine coolers. Now, speculation here is that This is possibly where she got her beer and her wine for the party she was having later. Now, when I say party, it was Lorraine and a younger female friend that was probably her age, 13 or 14, and then an older male friend. The male friend, he was somewhere between 15 and 21, was what some sources said. I do have to point out that there was also the possibility that there was another older male hanging out with the group that night, but that has never been proven. The friends are all drinking, having a good time. And then 1230 in the morning, the older male friend hears voices out in the hallway. So I do have to say with this apartment, there's a front door and then there's a back door. So there are two ways to get out of the apartment from what I understand. They hear some voices in the hallway and this older male friend thinking he's going to get in trouble wants to get out of there. They think it's Judith and the boyfriend returning from this tennis match. Lorene takes them out the back door. And according to the male friend, she closes the door and locks it behind him. That was about 1230. And then at 115, Judith and her boyfriend do return to the apartment. Now, Lorraine and Judith live on the third floor. And there are hallways to get to the apartment that they live in. And all of them are dark. And there's a reason why they're dark. It seems that every single light bulb is unscrewed. Judith doesn't know this at the time. She just assumes it's dark and isn't really putting much thought into that. They get to the apartment and Lorraine and Judith were very adamant about locking their doors, but the door's unlocked. So Judith is not very happy about this. She goes to see if she can see her daughter. And she sees a figure sleeping in the bed and she's okay, she's here and she's safe and whatever. But then the boyfriend tells Judith that the back door is left open. So not only is the front door unlocked, but now also the back door has been left open. Judith returns to go see why this back door was left open. And she goes to wake up the person sleeping in the bed. And it's not Lorraine, it is the female friend. Now, the female friend is confused. She doesn't know what's going on. She had been drinking. And all she could tell Judith is that Lorraine had said she was going to go sleep on the couch. And on the couch, there's a blanket and a pillow and no Lorraine. Lorraine is gone. But all of her possessions are left in the house, including a brand new pair of shoes that she had begged her mother for her birthday. There were no signs of a struggle. There's a police report file. Right away, police think that this is a runaway. They do start to change their minds once they do realize that she didn't take anything with her. So they do a little investigating. They talk to a guy at the bus company who says he sold a ticket to a girl who looked like Lorraine. They talk to the bus driver who says that he dropped a girl off who looked like Lorraine. But later on, when they came back with a more recent photo of her and showed the bus driver, he had changed his story and he could not say 100% whether it was her or not. So it's pretty much a cold case. There's nothing. They don't have anything other than maybe a sighting or two that is not even confirmed. 
A few months after Lorene's disappearance, her mother, Judith, notices that there are some strange phone calls that are on her phone bill that were made from CD motels in California to a teen sex hotline that was ran by a physician out of California. Once they find that out, they go to talk to this doctor, but they don't get anything from him. He just says, I don't know her. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Five years later, he was asked again about Lorraine. And this doctor had said, oh, I don't know. There are teen girls and runaways that come to our house all the time. And maybe she could have been here. But then also my wife knows this porn star whose name was Annie Sprinkles. So they tracked down Annie and she basically was like, I don't know. Lorraine and I don't know the, this wife of this doctor. We're going to go back to about 1981 and Judith starts receiving phone calls. The phone calls come in the middle of the night, most of the time around 345 in the morning. And around Christmas time, these phone calls ramp up. She's not the only one who, who's getting calls though. Lorraine's aunt also gets a phone call. And then one of Lorraine's male friends also receives a phone call. But the caller does not say anything. And these phone calls actually continue until Judith actually does end up moving out of New Hampshire and moving to Florida um, several years later. And that's when the calls stop. Judith, of course, believes that this was Lorraine, but unfortunately, these calls were never put into a, a police report. There were sightings of someone who looked like Lorraine, but it couldn't ever be verified. One of the instances of that was of a woman who was in Alaska working as a sex worker. Lorraine wasn't the only young woman to go missing in a really short time span in the same kind of general area. So a month prior to L Lorraine's disappearance, there was a 15-year-old named Rachel Elizabeth Garden who went missing. She lived about 35 miles away from Lorraine. Um, and she looked like Lorraine. She, six weeks later, after Lorraine's disappearance, there was another woman. She was a 25-year-old mom named Denise Ann Denel. So Denise went missing as well. She was leaving a party. She was going to go to another party. And she also went missing, never to be seen or heard from again. She also looked similar to Lorraine. So you have two girls besides Lorraine that go missing that look very much like her. And they're all in the same area. Denise actually lived two blocks from Lorraine. The other episode, a little bit more detail on, on certain things, but that's what we know. She's been missing for 43 years. With Rachel's case, do we know anything more about her disappearance? If she was involved with any party situation or alcohol or anything like that? What I know about Rachel is that Rachel was out buying cigarettes and gum, but she had told her family that she was going to go stay at her friend's house that night. And her friend, when I later asked, was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Honestly, for when it comes to Rachel, I feel like she probably left to go out. She wasn't going to go stay at her friend's house that night. Is Judith still alive? I, when I was listening to a podcast about this case, it sounded like, and this was like from four years ago though. So I, as of four years ago, it sounded like she was. I just wonder if she has a big online presence to where she could be found easily. I don't really think that she does. And yeah. honestly, when I looked things up, there isn't a ton about, about Lorraine. The male and female friend, they never released their names. There's not a lot about Judith. All I know is that she eventually remarried and moved to Florida. There were two males involved, right? Possibly. How do we know about the older male sneaking out the back door? Because he said that's what happened. Right. It's, it's him saying that. The other friend was passed out in the bed. And the rain's gone. He was ruled out as a suspect. I'm assuming that he was the one that went to the police because otherwise, how would they have known 
the police must have at least known his name or who he was, even though we don't. And then the other one is that five years after Loreen disappeared, he did end up killing himself. I have no other information about him or... And wasn't there a note or something that he left that just said something like, I can't take it anymore or I can't cope? Yeah. Very vague. Yes. But would yeah. that be vague to him if he didn't do it, but was known as the guy that potentially did? And he's saying, I can't take it anymore. That could be vague to us who have questions, but I don't feel like that would be vague to him who knew the answers. You're right. Oh, right. You're actually right. Or if he was a... 21 year old hanging out with a 14 year old even at 21 he had some type of problems and five years later he's just i can't take it anymore completely unrelated to lorraine at all but just he potentially already had mental health issues that's an interesting thought too cindy is that if he was 21 even if he was 18 why are you hanging out with a 14 year old small town america (laughs) This is the 80s. There's drinking and cigarettes involved. Mm -hmm. Um, What I find very interesting is so many names are not mentioned, and it's because they could probably have been a minor. Yeah. But what I found very interesting is even in modern reports, there's still no names, and I believe it's probably because of being a minor well, that's the only thing i could think of is oh, why they would you, release you think he was like 17 instead of giving this age range of 17 to 21 maybe it's the modern day of me speaking but i no, feel I that it. if the person could legally be mentioned they would mm-hmm. is there any other reason why you wouldn't mention a name other than yeah they're a minor and I just go back to the 80s. Obviously, I wasn't into true crime in the 80s. They would talk more about people's names and stuff because they hadn't really thought about it yet. That's putting our current spin on it. So I don't know if it would still be the same in the 80s. So what he had stated to the police was that they felt as though Lorene's mom was coming home. So he went out the back door I assume quickly, because if you're hearing them, you think they're coming through the front door, you're trying to go out quickly, but he says that he heard her lock the door. And to me, that's just sticking out because I don't know why he'd lie about that. I don't know if he's just putting it out there to give that something. Oh, I'm sure she locked it after that's what I believe happened. But I think Mm -hmm. if her mother was coming home and he's afraid of getting caught, he's not waiting around. He's running out that door. He's not going to know if she locked it or not. I feel like it would play into his favor if he said, I didn't hear if she locked the door. I don't know if she locked the door versus I heard her lock the door. If he was this bad guy, he, would, right. he could say, oh, she shut the door. I never heard it locked, which could lead to someone came in the back door. It's- yep, it was somebody other than me. I feel like anytime you give more details than are quote unquote necessary, you're trying to make a story big for a reason. I look at it as he was trying to give himself some sort of alibi. Possibly, but we don't know those questions that led to the report of those answers. The only other thing that I can think of would be is if he told himself that he heard that. And that's the story he believes. Or that's what he needed to tell himself to make it go, oh, because he could be going, she disappeared right after I left. And I wasn't around to protect her or stop whatever happened. And I need to tell myself that I heard her lock that door. Because if I hadn't heard her lock that door and she didn't lock that door, then all of a sudden I'm responsible. Do you know what I mean? If we know (laughs) he killed himself, then we have to know his name. They have not released it to the public. So who would have released that information that said this potential suspect in the Lorraine case killed himself five years later? Something is missing here. Wasn't he cleared as a suspect? He was. Yeah. So I'm sure if it's a local place, maybe the journalist can't legally say what his name is, but the journalist knows who it was. 
So they could have easily said like this guy over here, but just didn't put in relation to this case in the article. But I'm sure there's people out there that know who this person is. I feel like there's a missing puzzle piece in between those two things. Which is funny that you say that. Judith also thought that something was up with the story that the two friends had told. She didn't think that they were telling the 100% truth. Any chance they did a rape kit on the girl that was passed out? She would have to be proactive in saying something doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. They're they're not just going to say, oh, you were drunk and passed out and someone's missing. Let's collect evidence off of your body. The other thing about her being drunk and passed out, these girls were 14. The back door, do you know what room it connected to? In one of the podcasts I listened to, he went down a back hallway and said the door's open. In my mind, it was a kitchen, but he also said hallway, so I'm not sure. My cousin used to live in an apartment that had a front and back door. You'd walk in the apartment building in the hallway, and then you'd walk to her front door, which was in the living room, and then down the hallways. You'd go to the bedrooms and the bathrooms, and at the end of the hallway was the door to go to the back. And then to the back, it just opened up to the parking lot. And I know there were other levels, so that's what I would assume. It was a hallway that he left from where the front door maybe came in through the living room or something. And if it did go to the hallway, I feel like that would lend more credence to he heard the door lock because you can hear the click. Because I was imagining it if you went outside, like an outdoor kind of fire escape staircase. In my mind, I'm like, you could have heard a ton of different things and just said, I heard some kind of short noise. It must have been the click of the door lock. But if it's an indoor hallway, presumably at 1230 at night, it's very quiet. So maybe it did make a more prominent sound of the click. So it looks like there (laughs) is a main door here and I can't find anything with the layout of this apartment but with apartments that I've been into there's a lot of these on college campus like frat houses kind of deals when you go into the main door there's going to be a line of doors and stairs going up and down Mm -hmm. there can be front doors and back doors the the back doors are limited to obviously where your apartment is But then there's usually like a back door over here that will lead to it. Maybe it's a hallway or something. So this looks like it's on the other side. This is still the front door, but then here's like a back door. I don't know if that's to an apartment or what. Here's a balcony. Here's a balcony. So there's probably another doorway that leads to a staircase that will take you down to Mm -hmm. get out. So this isn't the typical apartment complex that we're probably picturing through discussion i just had a huge light bulb go off luke lived in an apartment like this when i first started dating him and david described it perfectly there's a front entrance that looks almost like a house you walk up a staircase you go into a living room you go through the apartment and in his case you exited in the kitchen and it went down a back staircase so there were two hallways essentially on either side of the apartment like how many apartments do we think are in here four or five I was yeah, it wasn't very many. I, I, there's not a lot of information on this apartment complex itself, but usually in setups like this, from what I know just in my college hometown, right, is this is a level for apartment one, a level for apartment two, a level for apartment three. Now, so there's that option, but there's also that there's one, two, three, four, five, six. I think it was more of the the six. So what I want to do next is move on to theories. And I am just going to come up right out and say, I'm going to start with my least favorite theory, which is that she ran away. Now, Lorene was very smart. She loved to sing. She loved to dance. She wanted to be an actress. She had this dream to move to California and to act Did she just up and leave to start her life in California as an actress the morning of her disappearance? She did get into a fight with her mom, Judith. 
Judith said that it wasn't anything that was like a super serious fight or would have led her to run away. Again, we don't really know what their conversation was. My biggest problem here is that she left all of her possessions. She didn't take anything with her, including the brand new shoes that she begged her mom for. I really didn't have much else on the she ran away thing. It's just when it's out there, okay, we have to look at it. There were people that speculated maybe the friends were there and the one friend was sleeping in the bed to throw the mom off for a little bit to buy her some more time so she could get further away and all of these things. But maybe the phone calls were her feeling bad that she ran away from home and she just wanted to call and just hear voices of familiar people. I don't personally believe that is what happened. The next theory would be Maybe she did leave the apartment on her own. Maybe she went out for a smoke and maybe that's when something happens to her because we know inside the house, there doesn't appear to be a sign of a struggle. So maybe she was outside when she could have been abducted. And that's going to lead us into our next theory of a serial killer. Now we know that the three young women went missing around the same time. Now let's go back to Rachel for a second. Because this is important. Rachel, when she went missing, she was seen that night talking to three men in a car. And it was later found out that one of the men actually was charged later on with a sexual assault. The guys that she saw in this car, they're shady characters already. It is suspected that they were responsible for whatever happened to Rachel. Okay. Denise was the 25-year-old mother of two that went missing the month and a half after Lorraine did. Denise was the one that lived two blocks away from Lorraine. She was out partying that night. They highly suspect that Denise was the victim of a known serial killer that lived in the area at the time. His name was Bob Evans, except for his name wasn't really Bob Evans. That was the name he was going by at the time. Terry Peter Rasmussen, who was responsible for at least six deaths. We know he did kill six people. There's also several others that they suspect that he was responsible for, and Denise is one of them. He lived a mile and a half away from Lorraine's house. What do we think about a serial killer? He was the Bear Brook murder yes. killer, right? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Even, yeah, kills his own biological daughter. Not an awful theory. It's not mine, but I can get there. Yeah, I feel the like it's thing... more plausible than her just running away, given the set of facts that we have. Was she going outside to, to smoke and then somebody came upon her? Mm -hmm. I was also thinking, which like a lot of things would have to come into play for this, especially given the female friend that was in the apartment. But what if they felt like the mother was coming home, the male friend ran out, Laureen realized it was not her mom and thought, oh, can I go down and see if he's still just hanging out in the bushes and she goes outside and someone comes across her outside. I was trying to figure out what kind of MO that Rasmussen had. And I'm going to keep bringing Keys up just because Keys stalked his victims and followed them and knew a lot of things about them before he usually did what he was going to do. As far as I could gather, I don't think that Rasmussen was the same kind of killer. This Rachel, Lorreen, and Denise all look the same. So... Mm -hmm. Was he wronged by somebody that looked that same way? This is Lorreen. So she's got a fairly pale face. She's fairly skinny. She has this black 70s feather, feathered-ish mm -hmm. look to her. Now, if we go to Rachel, again, mm -hmm. we've got this p fairly pale face, brown eyes, this brown, feathery, curly-ish hair. And then there's Rachel. And then Denise does look a little different, but not too crazy far off i guess her face is a little fuller i guess she does look a little older she has a pale face dark eyes so to me they all look very similar in my opinion i don't think that 
is that they look similar and that this, if it was a sex trafficker or something like that was out for a certain type of girl, I think it was for what was attractive at the time. And that fair mm. faucet look is what was attractive at the time. That fair the feather back, the yeah. little bit of mascara. Yeah. That all of the girls favored each other only because they were in style with the current time, which was that Farrah Fawcett look. Even if Denise looked 15, 16, let's say, they all look similar. They're all of the same general age. They're all out partying. So if there was an older boy that is around younger teenage girls all the time and is always out partying, it could be a person that has some other person involved in this that's not like a serial killer type. That was the next theory. What if it's not a stranger to her and it's someone she knew? Who knows how many people she told at the convenience store that, hey, my mom's out of town and we're going to have some beers. So what if it was somebody who knew her mom was out of town and this whole thing was like a planned abduction And if it was somebody older, maybe this person was first giving her some beer and then hanging out with her, partying with her, and was essentially grooming her to eventually abduct her. That's where you see the the light bulbs all unscrewed. It was planned. This person Mm -hmm. got her out of her apartment because whatever happened, I don't think happened in the apartment. They lured her out and then abducted her from there. So we're going to talk about First of all, the teen sex hotline and the doctor who was the person in charge of that, those calls came out of California. And then when they went to talk to him and he had no idea you know, about this and he sent them on their way to go talk to the porn star, who, by the way, I should note that everything that I read up on Annie Sprinkles afterwards, she's actually a, a feminist. And from what I understand, the type of person to help people get out mm-hmm. of the business versus force them into the business. Now, okay, the CD motels that the phone calls were made out to the teen sex hotline. One of these motels was a location for a person called Dr. Z, who is a child porn director. So the theory is that maybe she was abducted or even lured by California and then forced eventually into some sex trafficking situation. The phone calls that she made to her mom, she was maybe making those phone calls to her mom. Maybe it was her and then the aunt and then the friend. But the reason she couldn't say anything on the other end of the line is because she was being held captive in some way. So that is a pretty big theory in this case, especially because of the ties to the two strange doctors with the phone sex line and the child porn guy. And there's a lot of things that go back to California. It all goes together in its own way we should also say that there was that sighting although there's no proof that it was her but somebody thought they saw her in alaska doing sex work what i was thinking too is whoever the young man that was at their house whether he was someone that she knew from before or Mm -hmm. from just that night because i don't know if that was ever clear right she was going to party with him that night but did she know him before or not? But exactly. Yeah. Either way, especially in the 80s, I feel like they could have been, once he's gotten her drunk enough, he could have said, hey, I got a guy that can take you to California, be a model. And she might have went outside, got in a van with somebody and left. And then he was just on his merry way where he was just like the delivery the boy. And that's why he, he could be cleared of all things because he had an alibi. He didn't do anything. And then what you were talking about with the doctor and all of that, if that's where she was ended up, and then I can see all of that kind of things happening. I do have to say, one thing I learned in this research was porn production companies were not required to keep record of the ages or who worked for them until 1988. So even if she had been, they're probably going to lie about her age and her name. I have one more, but it was just a quick thing. I don't have a name because it was never released to the public. There was a man who lived relatively close. Now, he was 35. He was known to 
lure young girls into his apartment with the promise of beer. And then when they did investigate him, they found child porn in his apartment as well. And now it's time to speculate. I think the doctor thing is very strange. I think that for someone to be calling using the mother's collect account pin number, that's a weird thing. Mm -hmm. I would be very interested to know if she had any type of contact with this doctor before and like could they tie any previous phone bills where this number was popping up to this before these times. Like that happened after she went missing. I think it's interesting if she were planning to go meet the doctor or planning to meet somebody involved in that, it seemed as though she would have had a perfect cover with her mom being out of town to just be home alone, be able to sneak out, go somewhere and go meet with this doctor or whoever else. Instead, she had friends over and they were partying, they were drinking. Like, why would you have friends over if you were planning to go out and meet somebody that night? I think it could happen, but that seems a little strange to me. So I think if the doctor is involved or that's a possibility, the individual that maybe was at her house was the delivery person, came to the house and was like, okay, here she is. She's coming outside now. But to me, that's interesting that they didn't take the friend as well. Maybe they thought it was too risky. Maybe they couldn't lure the friend out of the house and they didn't want to go into the house to take her from the home. I do think that I'm very stuck on the doctor. I feel like he's involved in some way. He was a little too shady about, oh, maybe she was here. Maybe she wasn't here. It was like he was trying to be non-committal, but also cover up. Oh, if you find evidence of her here, she may have been here at one point. I think that's all a little strange and sketchy to me. But I do think that she was probably taken from outside the home, either lured somewhere or abducted. I don't think anything happened inside the home. The only way I could see no struggle happening is if somebody came in, gun to her head, a weapon of some kind, and said, you need to come with me right now. But then also you have the friend to contend with. And I know the friend says she doesn't remember anything, but if somebody came into the house with a gun, with a knife, I feel like that is something maybe she would remember if she did witness that. So I do think something happened outside the house. Whether it's somebody abducted her for the purposes of the doctor or it's somebody that just took the opportunity to abduct her when they saw her alone outside. I just have so many questions and we're not going to get any answers. But now that we've seen the house, you had to have a key to get into the main door. Or you could get buzzed in. So then that makes it easy for whoever was jacking with the lights could it have been a neighbor that maybe knew that Judith was going to be gone for the day? I can't even speculate. We got no names. There's too many missing pockets. I don't think she ran away. I feel like it had to be somebody that had access to the building. I love old cases because it leaves us a lot of room to speculate. However, I hate old cases because it leaves us a lot of room to speculate. I made a list to do some checkoffs. I don't think the phone calls are related i feel like things were public enough for people to just be assholes which is a new generational kind of thing i don't think the porn star or the doctor is related i think it was a grasping at straws kind of thing and oh here's this thing that might not be ethical so it's related to this i don't think they're related the guy that chose to end his life what i do question is if Judith is leaving the home, and at this time there wasn't, you can take your phone number with you. She chose to leave the home that was the last home that her daughter knew, which is means changing phone numbers. It makes me question respectively. It is known that she has had love interests in and out of the house. Could one of them have done something bad? to Lorraine 
And I wonder if mm. Judith knows a little bit more than what she's telling us because we hear of so many stories that people will not leave that house. They have that same landline that they've had since they bought the house because that's all that their missing child knows. And you're leaving states. And, and so I question that. Granted, respect. If you're having people over and drinking, I know in the 80s, smoking cigarettes is the coolest thing in the world. I wonder if her having people in and out of the house, which is why the front door would be unlocked, if that was pissing off neighbors. There is at least two sexual predators that live within listening distance of her house could she have went outside to smoke that last cigarette before her mother gets home and they're pissed about the noise and something happens i don't think there was this whole sex trafficking thing i think it was a spur of the moment thing and the last thing i will throw out is there are a lot of lot bulbs inside of an apartment. If I hear noise outside of my door, I'm at least looking to peephole. If I see a maintenance man or a familiar face undoing light bulbs or some kind of maintenance, I'm running it off as that. Someone is able to go onto different floors and unscrew all light bulbs. It has to be a familiar face. Tied to the building. It made me just think of something that you said, David. Um, if she was going to go outside to smoke, why wouldn't she just go on the balcony? I also wondered, too, if, what if when she's sending dude outside of, hey, I think I hear your mom coming, let's go out the back door. What if he's, hey, I'm going to wait for you outside and she and tennis player will go to bed and then you can sneak out and something went wrong there like maybe he was waiting on her maybe it was taking too long and he left and she went outside trying to find him. one of the first things that they did was check the back door so if he was like standing there you're busted i think he got himself away from the building and potentially was just hiding out somewhere because the plan was for her to sneak out and continue to drink or hang out with him. And maybe it took too long. Maybe mom didn't go to bed soon. You know what I mean? Maybe something took too long and he was like, ah, fuck it. I'm done. I'm leaving. She's not coming out. She's changed her mind. And that could be his guilt thing. Maybe he left and that's why he felt so guilty is because she was going to go meet him and he didn't wait for her. And then something happened in between. So let me start off by saying I have no clue. <laughs> Something that sticks with me though is it had to be somebody that knew her in some capacity because even if people knew that her mom and her mom's boyfriend were going to be out of town, you said that normally Lorene would go with them and this was like one of the first times that she didn't. If it had been somebody stalking her or the family and they knew that she was going out of town, they should have assumed that she was going with, if that's the normal routine. So she would have had to, in some capacity, be telling people herself that she was not going this specific time. Something else that had crossed my mind tonight was the grooming aspect of this because even if the guy could have been using her to gain access to these other young women that he could groom and if he's going to these other parties with these other girls if they're connected that could be his in and if he has a type for either himself or if he's finding women for other people. So I guess that's all I'm really able to come up with is that it was someone that knew her, knew that she was having a, an unusual schedule that her mom was going to be out of town. But my other thought is when was Judith supposed to be coming back? The timeline is something that I wonder. Do we know how far away they were? I do not. 
they probably finished the match and then went out. What if they just had some beers or something? And but, obviously they, they weren't just, unless it was that far away where the drive was going to take a while. But. So if that's the case, then I would have said, no, this is too far. It's going to be too late of a night. You're coming with me. We're going to get a hotel room. It'll be fun. Come with. Yeah. Yeah. But when you don't have to go as far away. Then you can stay home by yourself. But for this, no. You do you have to come. But there's not that first time that you say, okay, my child is old enough to stay by themselves. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. well, that's, that's, just, <laughs> that's just why I was curious of what the plan ahead of time was. Because if she knew that her mom was supposed to be staying the night somewhere, or if she was getting back at 1230, did her mom just say, I'll probably be back at some point tonight? Probably, maybe. But if they hear somebody in the hall and they're immediately like, oh my God, that's my mom, get out the back door, then you're probably not thinking your mother is staying all night an hour away. I think the male friend of some sort had something to do with it, not necessarily specifically but somehow lured her out to give her somebody to abduct that part is what i actually think happened i feel comfortable doing this type of speculation from a case 40 years ago probably not one from five years ago okay so if judith's boyfriend was some famous tennis player i don't know if he was famous so what if he specifically convinced uh judith to leave lorraine home this one trip and then he somehow arranged for her to disappear just so he could have Judith all to himself because all the time they've had to go to all these travel places, they've had to bring her 14-year-old daughter with. And then the phone calls, depending on what the guy was like, if he was somebody that wanted to be savior and this mom is feeling just horrible, he's still making these like prank phone calls, even to all of her relatives, just to keep her hope alive. And, oh, we got to stay here. And if he was a traveling tennis player, he could have been in California to make the phone calls from her long distance phone line. And all that California connection could just be the tennis player making the phone calls using Judith's pin number. I don't know if they stayed together very lo much longer after this. But if they did, he could have been the one that then convinced her to move to Florida because your daughter's gone. We need to start our life. I'm going to meld a lot of things together. I think it was human trafficking because I believe some of those sightings that they saw, I believe that she was trying to call when those calls were coming through. It could have been a copycat. It could have been the husband playing bullshit. But when I put the whole story together, those calls really make sense. So I do feel like it was just a, hey, mom, let me stay home. Let me hang out with my friends. We all got drunk together. I also believe the male friend was definitely the delivery driver, if you will, and got her to a place. Maybe they were hanging out a lot. Maybe he was grooming her and he's okay. Today's the day. Let's do it. And I'm going to also pull in some... Police corruption because, but there's a couple things. Okay, go with me here. Number one, the investigation was shit. We can all agree to that, right? They didn't really do anything with the apartment. They interviewed two or three people. It, it was bullshit. So why couldn't it be? You don't know until you do enough digging, but the police are involved in all kinds of shit. They're involved in drug trafficking. They're involved in people trafficking. They're involved in all these things because there's kickbacks. There's money. And if they're on the inside, it's very easy for them to manipulate things to make it work to the bad people's advantage. I see you, Janelle. But it happens. My thought is there was some kind of human trafficking ring going on. Let her go get this alcohol from the store. That makes her more vulnerable, naive. Let her hang out with this older guy. That makes her more vulnerable and naive. He calls and says, hey, I got some for you. I'm at this party tonight. Come to this place. They go through. They're unscrewing the light bulbs. They set it all up and then maybe knock on her door. And maybe they even said something crazy like, we have a report on your mom or whatever it is. Because I do think something happened to make her step outside the door. I'm going to go back to 
nothing was missing, including her fucking shoes. She walked outside of that door barefoot. I promise you. She thought she was going outside for two seconds and coming back in. Which would lead me to believe why the doors were open. Maybe she propped it or whatever. Old girls pass out in the bed. I think that has really nothing to do with it, to be honest. But I told you, I'm going to come back to why was this guy's name not released and what age was he really? I think he was the age they said he was because he's this older, cool guy that you want to hang out with. But he was also involved in this shit. And so the police are like, listen, we're going to keep your shit under wraps as long as you do A, B, C, and D for me. We're never going to put your name into this as long as you follow through. And I think she was trafficked. I'm not sure that the doctors, the porn star, really have anything to do with it. I think that was a lot of grasping for straws. But I do think the calls are involved. I do think she's probably in a different state. I do think she was human trafficked. And I do think she was alive for quite some time, probably not anymore, but there's all these pictures out there of her, what she would look like now and sightings that have been happening. And it just, it's too much that's coincidental with, I might've saw somebody, I might've had her call, the doors are unlocked, but these kind of all tie together for me. Okay. Honestly, I'm in the same boat as a lot of you. I agree that it was somebody she knows. I feel like the light bulbs were unscrewed on purpose as either a way to get in there and not be seen or get her out of there and not be seen. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with the phone calls. I feel like it very much could have been just some person who thought it was funny or was somebody who was the guilty party who just kept calling mom. And there were phone books then. So you could have called mom and aunt and whoever, like, but I definitely do think that it was somebody she knows. I lean more towards what we were all saying that she was possibly groomed. I really sit on the fence with the sex trafficking thing, but to me, it makes a lot of sense. The phone calls, I don't know if they were really happening or not, but I really do think that this was definitely a case of somebody who knew her, who knew that she was going to be in that house by herself and then took advantage of that situation. She was the target. She was the person. It's a sad case for me. Judith always felt like her daughter was alive and she always felt like her daughter was calling her. And that is just really sad. It's been 43 years and still we don't know what happened to Lorraine, but I do want to give you a number just in case anybody out there does have any information on this case. So the number is for the Manchester Police Department and it is 603-668-8711. Please give that number a call if you know anything about what happened to Lorraine. I really hope that someday we do have some answer as to what did really happen. But until then, all we can do is speculate wildly. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show today. We ask you to please subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else that you find your favorite podcasts, just so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at SWACPOD, S-W-A-C-P-O-D, or you can contact us via email for questions, comments, or case ideas. Our email address is slackpod at gmail.com. That's S-W-A-C-P-O-D at gmail.com. Thanks so much for speculating wildly with us tonight.